And, and a lot of, I've heard that in the churches a lot to point towards that we do need to do works. God expects us to do certain things. And if we don't do certain things, if we don't comply, if we don't, if we don't achieve some sort of goal, that we will not achieve salvation. And that's not what James is saying at all here. And it's not what uh, John was saying either. But what they were talking about is the same thing that was in Isaiah, in Isaiah, what Bill just brought up, or related to, and it is the feeling of guilt. What first John is talking about there, let me jump back to it. I am not going along with my notes. In the beginning of the chapter 3 of 1 John, he, he says that God calls us, calls us his children, and he calls and counts us as his children. And what a glorious and wonderful thing this is. What an honor our Heavenly Father has bestowed upon us by calling us and counting us his children. So John isn't trying to make the argument that you're not his children. He starts out in the chapter by saying, you are his child. We are his children. What he's talking about here is our own conscience, our own heart, our own thoughts. You see, if we believe God and his word and what he has said, if we believe and accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and died so that you might be saved and was raised from the dead so that you might live, if you believe that, then you must believe all that God has said or you must accept everything of God. We can't accept, or it doesn't do us any good to accept one part of it and leave the other out. And that's what James is talking about. That's why he says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith with works. Well, really what he was saying was, uh, if you truly have faith in God and in his word, you will have works out of that. And the works he's talking about is loving our brothers and sisters. When they refer to the law, they're not referring to the law of old, but the covenant of new, or the law of freedom. Which the law of freedom is to believe in Jesus Christ and to love our fellow man. And where your conscience convicts you is because you are a new creation. And then let me take a step back. Some of us have believed in the past, and there are still some of us that believe that God convicts us and condemns us of things. And I don't believe that's the truth. You see, I believe that the Holy Spirit, the only thing that you ever convicted or condemned about is through the Holy Spirit, and He only convicts you so that you'll receive salvation. The conviction and, con and condemnation comes from when we do accept Christ and we are born again and we are given a new spirit or we become a new man, our heart, our mind, our thoughts doesn't go along with the believe in one part and not believe in the other part. Our mind, our hearts can't put that together. It says, well, if you believe God has given you salvation, has freely given you salvation and goodness and kindness and love, and He wants you to love others as He does, and you don't, your heart doesn't understand that. And what it does is it brings conviction and condemnation on you. It's your own 
heart of your own thoughts. It's the new creation that God gave you when you accepted when you accepted Jesus. That's what condemns you. It condemns you because, like as in Isaiah, your spirit is in communion with God's spirit and it sees what God does and what he has done. And your own spirit thinks that you don't measure up. It condemns you, it convicts you. What I'm talking about here and why I'm talking about this, what in the world are you going down? I'm going this way, Scott. What I really want to talk about is I want to feel, talk about the feeling of guilt. How many of you have felt guilty? How many of you feel guilty even today? How many of you are saved and sanctified, set apart for God, but every once in a while, either you do something or you did something that you just feel really guilty about. Yeah. You condemn your own, your own heart condemns you. I do. I have. How many of you have done something in your past a long time ago? Maybe it wasn't even your fault. But that very act or that very thing that happened in your life brings condemnation to you and conviction. I am. I do. Is that where God wants us to do? No. You see, He wants us to believe that we are forgiven and that we are cleansed and that we are new creations in Christ. He wants us to know that we are saved and sanctified, that we're pure and that we're holy. And it's our own heart it does that to us sometimes. But in this scripture here, in 1 John 3, it says that God is bigger than our hearts. He's greater than our hearts. Our salvation then against guilt is believing in God and not trusting our own emotions and our own feelings. And why is that important? That's important because we can boldly go before God as sons of faith. If you do not believe that you're worthy, it's hard to accept what God has given you. And it's even harder to go before Him in prayer and ask something and believe that you'll receive it because of guilt and condemnation. It is important that each and every one of us realize who we are and what Christ has done for us. It, it truly grieves my spirit. You know, I read something a couple days ago, and I guess probably what started this thing off. I was reading it, and it was John Wesley. And he was talking about how back then or whatever, it was a, a common deal in his time period or something that men of cloth, clergies, would ask individuals, would come up to individuals and say, who do you belong to? And if they didn't immediately say, I belong to Christ Jesus, if they... If they if they hesitated just for a minute, they would say, I know who you belong to, Satan. Because a man of God would have spoke up immediately and said, I am of God. <laughs> if somebody came up to you and actually said that, it scared you. You just take a few steps back and you'd probably run or something. And me, it'd be like all I did most of my life. And I'd go, oh, I knew that. <laughs> Why did I say that? I knew that answer. Really, I did. I'm not just saying that. I knew that answer. <laughs> he realized that even the people that were of God, people that had accepted what Jesus Christ were answering the same way or not answering the same way, however you want to look at it, 
And we're under condemnation, even deeper condemnation, because of what the clergy was doing with them. But that what he was looking for is that first question, that question that surprised people, threw it in their face, that they waited and hesitated, and sometimes they waited and hesitated because we weren't fully convinced that that was the answer or that we really are gods and belong to him. And that littlest of doubt is what hinders us from receiving all that God has for us. Isaiah, the example that Bill talked about, Isaiah went from feeling God's presence came in there. God was probably that day, was like, I'm going to go down and visit him. I love him so much. He is so cool. And he is the right man for this job I got. I'm going to go down there and say hi to him and all that. And he gets down there and then Isaiah goes to pieces and shaking him like, oh, the Lord, they look clean. And it's freaking out all the time. His dad is going, hey, no, 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 no. It's not like that. You're cool. You are the man of the hour. I love you. I want to come down here. I want to visit you and everything. And I need you to do something because I know you can do it. And Isaiah trembled in fear. Gideon did that same thing and hid from the Lord. After that, I then went around for three years naked. Went around three years what? Naked, yeah. Yeah, it was reaffirmed. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be pretty bold to do with the naked deal. Well, they can't make it in churches. The point I'm trying to make is this. We do blame things on the devil, and I believe sometimes the devil throws you a screwball. But is our own heart, it's our own conscience, it's our own thoughts, that even though that we're saved, compares ourselves to Christ, which he is the standard that we're supposed to follow. But we do so and make judgment ourselves. You know, Paul said he didn't judge himself. He said that uh, he wouldn't judge any man and he wouldn't judge himself. But that wasn't his job. It was God's job. And God would do it in the right time. It doesn't mean that we need to, don't need to be looking at ourselves and thinking about it and listen to our own conscience and our own heart and listen to the Spirit of God, but there is a difference, brothers and sisters. There's a difference. There's a difference when you say, boy, you know what? I probably ought to do this. And if your heart's telling that, you probably ought to do this. But that's the difference. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about right now is conviction, condemnation on your life that keeps you from receiving what your Father has for you. And that's not healthy and it's not good. If we don't think that we deserve it, then how do we go boldly into the throne room? and ask our Father. You are not perfect. There's only one that was ever perfect. And you are going to fail. And I don't mean to prophesy against you, but if you are perfect and you continue to be perfect, they would have hung you up. They would have nailed you to a tree. But that doesn't mean that you're not God's and belong to Him and His name isn't written in the palm of His hand and sealed forever. I believe, and I've talked about this before, I believe that we do have and need to make decisions. Every day in our life we make decisions. I just believe that. I believe God gave us a free will to make those decisions. And that in our walk, we make decisions daily. We decide whether we want to be nice to somebody or whether we want to be mean. We decide whether we want to drive over the speed limit or 
by the speed of the words he builds or not words he builds. We can disagree with it all we want, but some things are just the law and some things are good for us, but we can choose not to. And I don't believe, I don't believe that that, now I know that that isn't what your salvation depends on. Your salvation depends on whether you've accepted Jesus Christ, that first he's the Son of God, and secondly, that he died for you. And that he rose that you might live with him eternally. But the laws of freedom, the covenant that we're in now, the new covenant, there is sowing and reaping. There's decisions that each and every one of us make. The good thing about it is every time we make a decision, God multitasks, as I've talked to you a couple different times. And in this particular incident on, uh, not James, but in 1 John, what he's talking about there, if we go to, let's go back to, let's go back to 18, 1 John 3, 18, okay. Little children, let us not love merely in theory or in speech, but in deed and in truth, in practice and in sincerity. By this we shall come to know, perceive, recognize, and understand that we are of the truth and can reassure quiet conciliate and pacify our hearts in his presence. You want to get rid of a guilty feeling or a condemnation in your life? Love somebody. God has asked us to love. He's asked us to do two things. The covenant of the promise, the law of freedom says to love God and to love mankind. None of us are perfect, but God does want us to make an effort in loving each other. Knowing that you're not going to be perfect. But in doing so, it stills your heart, your conscience, the guilt, the condemnation that's in you. Yeah, every day we got to get up and we got to make a decision to do certain things that maybe we don't feel like being. That's being nice to that guy that you work with that is a total jerk. And in that way, in that way, when James was not saying that it is through works that you receive your salvation. And nor am I, and I repeat this please, you'll never receive what God has you by works. It's only by accepting and resting in what He is. But your heart will always find it difficult to buy into that God has given me everything when you don't obey what God has asked of you to do. No conditions on it. He just said, look, Love me, love everybody. And your heart doesn't allow you to do one and not to do the other. That's what James was trying to say. If you really believe this, then he'll really believe that. That they're not separated. If you don't want your heart, if you want to convince your heart that you are that you are God's and have all that God has, then walk in love. Make a decision to walk in love every day. It also says in here, there's this guy named Barclay, and he was somebody. I don't know who he was. <laughs> He was a Bible. He was a Bible guy. You know who he was, Danny? Barclay. William Barclay. Maybe. <laughs> and Barclay says this. He says, "The perfect knowledge which belongs to God and to God alone is not our terror, but our hope." 
The perfect knowledge which belongs to God and to God alone is not our terror, but our hope. Fear. What he's saying there is we all are screw ups and we're all going to screw up every once in a while. But our hope is in, is in the knowledge that God sees on our hearts and he sees the love that's in us and the effort that we make and even though we're not perfect, He knows our hearts. It's not a terror. We can't hide anything from God. He knows everything that we do. He knows everything that we're going to do before we do it. We should not fear that He knows that, but it is our hope. It's what, it's, it's our, it, it is our salvation. It is the way that we stop the guilt in knowing that even though I'm a screw up, God knows my heart and He knows that I love Him. How many of you prayed that way? I do all the time. Maybe you guys are a bunch of good guys. My neighborhood. Too. It's like, Lord, I do something. I don't even know. I know. I know. I know I don't have to partake, I don't have to apologize for doing something wrong. I know that God knew that I was going to do something. I did it and I'm forgiven. But I do apologize and I'm sorry. And my hope is that God looks upon me and sees that I'm uh, sometimes lousy at this whole thing. But He knows that I love Him. And that I'm trying. But not to gain any points. Because I, I have all the points that I need. I got points plus. <laughs> but I do it because I, I'm in love with the guy who loves me more than anything. And then my conscience is clear because I cannot separate the two between what he has given me and what he wishes me to do. That's what James meant. That's what this is telling us. We don't have any excuses not to love each other. God gave his life for us. He died for us. Can we not live for each other? James says, the have faith without works. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith with works. Amen. That when you know the truth and you believe it, when you truly understand and believe what God has given you and who He is, then you will have a desire to do the one thing that He asked you to do. Apparently, you got the first one down. What I want you to do is that second one. Love the people that I love. That's His commandment. Love me and love everybody else that I love. And when we make an effort for that, that's what's the, that's what that's talking about. When we make an effort, a true effort, to love each other, to put others first, our hearts will not condemn us. And then we'll be able to go boldly before Him in prayer and ask, and then we'll have faith of sons. You know what that is? Faith of sons? A child, when he runs to his father, knows the answer. Can I have something to eat? A stranger doesn't. A child knows. A child runs to his father, his parents, and asks for something, knowing that they will give it to him. It's a faith of a son. A faith of a child. A stranger knocks on a house. He ain't so sure whether they're going to feed him or not. Loving others, in turn, is showing love to ourselves. 
that benefits ourselves. Like everything that God ever does, He never asks you to do something that don't come right back on you. Love so that your heart knows who you are in Christ. And it does not convict you. And then you may boldly go before your Father. Not in saying, I have done, but in knowing that you have faith in God and His Word and His commandments and that you live in love and live in the new covenant and follow the law of freedom. I... Uh, this one, this one I spent a few days trying to, I was going back and forth, and I didn't really, it didn't seem to, I told Tammy tonight, I was reading it tonight, I did what James called, he's practicing his talking. <laughs> I used to go out on the porch, you know, and actually read it aloud, because if you read it aloud, it helped, you know, that's supposed to help you when you read it aloud. If you want to do good reading aloud, then you need to practice reading aloud. I heard that once. Okay, so I got outside the porch and the very first time I was out there, I think Tammy said, uh, James, where's Uncle Scott? And he said, he's outside practicing, he's talking. <laughs> so now I just say, I'm going to go outside and practice my talking. I told Tammy when I came in, I didn't know where this was going to go. I wanted to talk about, all right, I'm going to tell myself. And I'm going to wrap it up right now. <laughs> the last few weeks I felt guilty about some things in my life. And uh, I didn't like feeling guilty. For and it made me, when I started feeling guilty, it took away a joy yeah. from me. It stole a joy from me. Well, I didn't like it. I've been, for the last year, I've been waking up singing and I get in the mood. Mm -hmm. And I woke up like, you know, just, I didn't have it, I was missing it. I let a situation that happened steal something from me. And it was me, God didn't believe me. He was always there. Yeah. I didn't like that feeling of guilt and I wanted to know, like, What's the Bible saying about feeling guilty? That's what led to this. Now, I also talked to my pastor about it. And I read and I prayed about it. Three things you're supposed to do, right? Ask your wife first. <laughs> that's not good. They go to God. No, that's not and then she says, go talk to the pastor. Yeah. <laughs> she says, talk to the pastor. Don't let brothers and sisters, this is, I'm going to close with this. This is what I'm saying. Do not allow yourself to get down, to feel guilty, to feel conviction, condemnation. Deal with it. Find out what it is. If it's something that you need to do, if you need to go to apologize to somebody, then go apologize to somebody. If it's, if it's something you really don't need to be, it's just your wrong thinking, yeah. like, okay, I'm feeling bad about that, and I don't really shouldn't even feel bad about that. But figure out what it is. Pray, go to God, talk to your pastor, <coughs> talk to your wife, talk to a loved one, get rid of that guilt and condemnation. Yes. Because it weakens you, it steals joy from you. It doesn't allow you to go before your father, boldly before yeah. your father, and ask what you will expect in it to come. Guilt is a horrible thing. God doesn't want us to live that way. He does want us to compare ourselves to Jesus in a positive fashion, remembering that he lives in me. That's all I got. I want to finish out with a prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, just take, Lord, please take what I've shared today and uh, use it to help somebody. I believe the Holy Spirit is 
I know this to be true. The Holy Spirit is uh, what teaches us, reveals the mysteries to us. I ask the Lord that what I, what I talked about tonight, that it would go into people's hearts, these my brothers and sisters' hearts, and that you would do something with it to help encourage and edify Minister to them, protect them, keep them, bless what they set their hands to, Father God. Show them, Father, how much you love them, how much you adore them. Help them to have a good week. Help them to show themselves. Help them to show themselves in love or show, help them to represent Jesus. God's holy name I pray, amen.